welcome to worship at Hunts Memorial United Methodist Church. If we just met, my name is Reverend Carissa Serber, and it is such a joy to have you here in worship today. And isn't it an extra joy to have our choir leading us outside? Amen. If you're back for the first time in a long time, I just want to orient you to all these papers we handed you when you came in. Since we're outside, your mini hymnal is in this packet. This just has all the hymns you'll need in the order they're in. And then this blue page has both the scripture for the day as well as the Apostles' Creed on the back, which you'll need later in the service. If you'd like to join me for Bible study this Wednesday, it's kind of a drop-in whenever you'd like situation. And it's all on Zoom, one hour during your lunch break on Wednesday. And so if you'd like to join us, just keep this blue paper and write down your reflections on these questions on the front side. And then that's what we'll talk about this Wednesday when we gather. It is so good to be in worship with you as we gather together to celebrate what we believe and to be changed by that message. I'm going to invite Barb to come forward now as we all stand and join in the call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Come, let us proclaim the strength of our faith. We believe in God, Father, Son. But this faith is not just believing the right things. This faith is about transformation. When we offer our hearts to God, we are captivated. And so, we give our hearts to God who creates us. We give our hearts to Jesus who redeems us. We give our hearts to the Spirit who sustains us. God in community, holy in one. Fill us with your compassion and grace. Amen.
morning. Hi to all of you. Is this the best day ever? Whoa, I love it. I'm so happy. Um, hi guys. How many of you have started school? Good. How many of you have had any tests yet? Okay, good. So you're used to this. So you're going to have another test right here, right now. Okay, oh no, okay. You'll know all this stuff because you guys are so smart. First off, what's the name of the Son of God? Jesus. Okay, yeah. did you all know that one? Okay, good. Some, somebody tell me about the birth of Jesus. Who wants to talk about that? Excellent. Born in Bethlehem. Born in a stable. Anything else? Everyone came to see him, including three wise men, shepherds. The three kings, the three wise men. Yep. Okay. Um, Jesus had friends who went places with him. What were they called? The disciples, very good. And he had other friends. Do you know about his other friends? He had a lot of friends that went with him. Disciples were just 12 of the friends. He also had Mary and Martha and another Mary and another Mary. It was a very popular name in those days. Um, um, he had a lot of friends who went with him. And the disciples were people he taught so that they could be teachers for other people. Okay, Jesus worked miracles. Can you tell me one of his miracles? He took a little bit of fish and bread and made it enough to feed 5,000. Did you have one? Did he turn? He turned water to wine. Oh, thank you, water to wine. That's my favorite because that's his very first um, miracle. Yes. He did. He saved people's lives. He, he walked on water. He walked on water. You guys are so good at this. So very, very good. You're passing... A plus stars all over. So the last one is, why did Jesus come to earth? Sorry? To help, for, to give our sins. That's excellent. Um, anything else? So I think that God sent his son to earth so that he could be an actual voice to speak to the people and say, I love you, and you, and you, and I'm here for you, and you. If you look, read the Old Testament, I feel like in the Old Testament, God is far away. But when the New Testament comes, Jesus brings God closer to us. And it all starts with the beginning of the, of the Lord's Prayer. What are the two words in the Lord's Prayer? First two words. Our Father. So suddenly, God goes from being something remote up there to our father and you know about your father and you know about your mother and you know about your grandparents and this is something tangible that you can love and to know that God loves you like your father and your mother so let's say a prayer if you all join us with this that would be great ready dear God thank you for sending Jesus so that we know you love us amen Remember that Jesus is with you everywhere you go, in school, on the soccer field, at work, in the garden, wherever you are. Jesus is there. And here. Yes, you're right, Abigail. Um, okay, let's uh, say the Lord's Prayer all together. Who can start us with this? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Thank you very much. Enjoy Sunday school.
we are in week number two of trying a new Sunday school pattern. Um, and so our older kids have been in Sunday school already between services, so they can then continue to worship with us here in the worship space. And our younger kids are heading off with Miss Lisa to head to Sunday school. Um, older kids, you are not too old to get wiggly, so PSA to the parents, there are activity bags over by Mr. Robert. So if anyone gets wiggly and needs something, we got you covered. Can you tell I'm a mom? I get it. It's all good. We are here to worship God today who hears every single one of our prayers. And so if you have a prayer that you would like for us to lift up um, as a prayer team, or if you'd just like for me to know something, these prayer cards are where you checked in and received your bulletin. Please just grab one and you can fill it out, hand it to me, or just pop it in the offering plate um, and mark it private or not, whatever, whatever is most meaningful to you. Let's turn now to God in prayer. God, we gather in worship on this beautiful day, just in awe of your creation. As the cool breeze blows through, we are grateful for this gift upon gift upon gift that you've given us. For this beautiful day, for this warm church family, for new friends and familiar faces that surround us. God, for all these things, we give you thanks. Lord, as we come to you proclaiming our belief in song and prayer and praise, we ask that you would continue to transform our hearts. As we give our hearts to you, we entrust our whole lives to your hands. And we lift to you the good days and also the things that most worry us. God, this day we lift up especially the names that are on our prayer cards. We pray for the family of Gussie Price. We pray for Sam. We pray for Tommy's family. We pray for all those names that we name now in the silence of our own hearts. Oh God, come and fill our hearts with your peace. You are the one who came to be with us in flesh and blood so that you would make it abundantly clear that you love us and that you would do anything for us. For that, we just say, wow, and thank you. God, be with us and transform our hearts as we continue to worship you. Amen. Friends, would you rise now? I know the bulletin doesn't say rise in body or spirit for this song, but let's do it so we can sing out together. I love to tell the story. Today we're continuing our series on the Apostles' Creed with the second third about, you guessed it, Jesus himself. So we're going to sing this hymn, I Love to Tell the Story of Jesus and His Love.
The scripture reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Today we continue our worship series on the Apostles' Creed as we focus on the second third of the Creed, which says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. This scripture tells us more about Jesus and what it means to believe in him. From the New Revised Standard Translation, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Patry number 70, and we've been singing 71 for about a year, so if that was a little unfamiliar and you're giggling to yourself, um, I am with you. <laughs> it happens. So last weekend, uh, Matthew and I were watching a bank heist movie, which is a pretty common thing for us. We love a good heist movie. And as we watched this particular one, which I'm not going to tell you the name of it because I don't want to ruin it for you, so it's a surprise if you watch this movie later. Uh, but there was a line in it that stood out to me um, as the crew gathered. You know, in a good heist movie at the beginning, you got the crew gathering. So you have like the hacker and the thief and the spy guy and the brainiac, and they're all gathering together. They don't quite trust each other yet. And as they gathered, they were questioning each other's motives and saying to each other, why are you here? You know, in the intense way you do in an action movie. Why are you here? And the spy guy turned and he just said, loyalty. And then the Brainiac kind of turned to the side and said, yeah, but loyalty to what? And I couldn't get that out of my head. Loyalty to what? Um, and as it turns out, the whole movie kind of hangs on that, which is why I'm not telling you what movie it is. It's a surprise. Uh, but I kept thinking about this loyalty. Loyalty is why we're here. Loyalty to what? Because every Sunday we return to church for worship, perhaps out of loyalty, and as we turn to the statement of the creed, the statement of belief, we're proclaiming, in a sense, our loyalty to Jesus, to God, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so this question hangs over worship the way it hangs over this whole movie. If you're here because of loyalty, loyalty to what? Let's pray. God, you have done so much through your son Jesus Christ and so we ask that in this time that the word who became flesh would be the word who is with us and among us that that word would speak to us and change everything so that we would become more like him we ask all this in Jesus name amen so as Barbara said we are in week 
three, three, week three of four of the Apostles' Creed series, we believe. And today we're talking about that second third about Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And so before I dive in to, to teach about the creed and to teach about today's scripture, let's read this creed together. Um, you can recite it from memory or read it off of the blue page, whichever you're most comfortable with. Let's join together in saying this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So today we're going to focus in on that second third. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And I just want to do a brief teaching through those lines before we then open it up to ask more deeply, uh, what does it mean to believe in this person, Jesus Christ? So let's first look at these lines. Why are these lines the lines that are here? When I was growing up, I always wondered, yeah, but what about the other cool stuff Jesus did? Why isn't that in the creed? <laughs> what about all the stuff God did in the Old Testament? Why isn't that in the creed? But the things that are in the creed are like the key must-have points about who Jesus is and why Jesus is important. So let's talk about those points. First it says, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Jesus Christ. Let's take that word, Christ. Christ is the Greek word that's the, the same as the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one. Like a king would be anointed or a priest would be anointed. So Jesus Christ means Jesus the anointed one. In a way, when we say Jesus is the Christ, or the synonym for Messiah, we're saying there's continuity here with what God has done in Israel. That continues on in Jesus, this anointed one. And Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the, his only son. Only son tells us that this is a unique and special relationship. There's no other relationship like it. This is God's only son, our Lord. Our Lord. Remember, this is a we're saying Jesus Christ, our only son, our Lord, in a time when the Roman Pledge of Allegiance was Caesar is Lord. And so in the face of that, these Christians are saying, no, Jesus is my Lord. To say, and I believe in Jesus Christ, the, the anointed one, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That is to say, this is a birth that is special and is unique but it is also a birth that was very real. Jesus had a real mom who really went into labor and really had a baby. This is a real birth. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. This is not to say put Pontius Pilate on the spot as if nobody else was involved. But this is saying like when you would say, oh, during the Reagan administration. Right? This puts it in a place and time in history. Suffered under the Pontius Pilate administration. Right? This says the death of Jesus happened in real life in real time, in our history, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Here's where we see this pattern in the creed, that it goes down, 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 and then up, up, up. Jesus was born, he came to earth and was born, and then he suffered, and he died, and was buried. And he didn't just die in any old way, he died from capital punishment, like the state executed him the way a criminal would be executed. And not even a dignified execution, but a low class, you're not even worth a dignified execution. That's what crucifixion was. So we see the descent of Jesus, that Jesus was willing to come all the way down. He suffered, died, crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended to the dead. That is, Jesus continued the entire way down, unafraid, to go into the pit of death itself. Go back to my heist movies that I love so much. Early Christians thought of it in the sense like Jesus was storming the camp of evil itself. Like God entered a world in where humanity was held by the forces of evil. And at the cross it seemed that the devil had won and taken home the prize package of Jesus himself. And so he placed the prize package in his safe. But it turns out it was a time bomb. 
because on the third day, Jesus rose again. It went off, and the very pits of hell and death themselves was destroyed. This is the pivot point. The resurrection is that thing that the creed emphasizes. Jesus came down, 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 and then the resurrection. And so then Jesus went up, up, up. On the third day, he rose again. You might be saying, Carissa, third day, can we not count? It is not 72 hours between crucifixion and resurrection. But friends, the ancient Romans counted like cruise ship days. So the day you leave counts the whole day. The day you come back is a whole day. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, third day, he rose again. Jesus, as it turns out, is not a victim only of Good Friday, but the victor of Easter Sunday. And Jesus continues the ascent upward. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Easter continues. The incarnation is not over. And Jesus has the place of highest honor and greatest favored and shared authority with God the Father Almighty. And then it says, we'll come again to judge the living and the dead. And you might think to yourself, ooh, that sounds scary and kind of judgy. <laughs> But we're really talking here about Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. We're talking about Jesus will come to put in place justice. Justice, when everything is in its proper place. I'm going to read you an excerpt from Gonzalez about what justice means. He says, justice is when no one oppresses another, when all show mutual respect, when life and freedom and peace are affirmed. A just ruler will not only punish evildoers and reward those who are good, but will also protect the weak. A just ruler will not only make certain that the laws are obeyed, but that the laws themselves are just. That they do not favor the rich and powerful just so they may become more rich and powerful. Because such justice is not contrary to love, but is actually a form of love. We believe that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead, and that in that justice, there will be the full expression of his love. And wow, that is good, good, good news. That's the creed that we proclaim. So what does it mean to believe in this person then, to believe in Jesus? Because I bet that some of you, and maybe some people that you know, have had moments where you think, I like this Jesus guy. I like the things he says. He seems to have good philosophies, but I don't know so much about the really believing fully in him. So what is the difference between saying, I can respect you as a teacher, and believing wholeheartedly in Jesus? Well, in the Gospel of John, it talks a lot about people who believe in Jesus. And the Greek words that are used in there are pisteo, pistis, pistos, depending on what part of speech we have, right? Pisteo is the verb to believe, to have faith in, to put your trust in. Pistis is the noun, faith, belief, trust, conviction. Pistos is the adjective, faithful, devoted to duty. As in God is so faithful that God is the God of absolute integrity, never going back on his word, always thoroughly dependable. To believe is to have faith in something and to put your trust in that thing. A couple weeks ago, I talked about how when we say, I believe, it's like saying a marriage vow to say, I give my heart to you. I trust in this thing and I put my life into this, the hands of this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here's what that looks like in John. In John, people start believing in Jesus when they recognize how amazing his signs and wonders are. The kids named some of these, right? Jesus performs the sign of turning water to wine in Cana. And his disciples, it says, it revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The Samaritan woman at the well in chapter 4 has a personal encounter with Jesus. And then it says, and many in that village believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Jesus says, go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke. And then, not just believing the word, but when his son did rise again, he believed wholeheartedly with his whole household. Belief, we see in John, means not just being in awe of the signs and the wonders, but trusting the man himself. I love the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus takes two loaves and, or five loaves and two fish and turns it into enough to feed a crowd of 5,000. And then the next day, they're like, okay, so what's next? Come on, 
What's the next sign? What are you going to do next? You know, if you just do a sign, we will believe in you. They actually say that to him. Can you imagine the nerve that they have? After he fed them to say, what's the next sign? If you show us a sign, we will believe in you. And he says to them, you are missing the point. The point here is not to believe in the stuff I do. The point is to believe in me, the person. John 6, 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him who the Father has sent. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God, he says. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes will have eternal life. And this is a difficult teaching, they say. And so thousands of disciples turn away at this point. But Peter and the twelve stick around, and Peter says, Lord, where can we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We see in the Gospel of John, the belief means trusting in the man himself, even if you don't really understand what's going on. Even if you're not sure that you really know what's going on, you can still trust and believe and have faith in Jesus. After all, the resurrection, it says, the other disciple who reached the tomb first went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture. I love that. He did not understand what was happening, but he believed. He had faith in something. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, Jesus says. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works that I do. And then we see, of course, over and over that belief is what leads to new life. One of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John is in chapter 11. You know this story, right? Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for three days, and Jesus finally comes, and he stands in front of the tomb, and he turns to Martha, and he says, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then he roll away the stone, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And he came out of that grave. Belief. New life. We experience new life when we trust in Jesus to bring that new life to us. And so John concludes his gospel by saying, that's the point of why I wrote this in the first place. I wrote this so that you may come to believe, chapter 20, verse 31, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That's belief. That's trust. So then the question for us is, what would it look like in our actual lives if we actually lived this way? What would it look like for us to believe in Jesus and live like we've given our hearts away to God? It might seem like foolishness to live like you've given yourself away. And certainly the scripture in 1 Corinthians that Barbara read affirms that. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, it says. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul writes to the church, he says, come on, where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater? Show me. And has God not made all of that wisdom foolish? For in the wisdom of God, the world did not go, know God through wisdom. And so God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe, who trust. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ and him crucified. I got to tell you, this was offensive. <laughs> Because you might be sitting there saying, yeah, I believe in signs. Yeah, I believe in wisdom. And Paul says, no, no, no. We believe in Christ and him crucified, even when it seems like foolishness to everything else. Paul emphasizes that while all the people that he meets in the world are focused on developing their own smarts and their own power, he is focused on none of that. In the next chapter, he even says, for I decided to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Crucified. So I came to you in fear and trembling. Paul could have said, I decided to come among you presenting my resume as a scribe and a Pharisee and how I am very smart and also a Roman citizen and therefore you should listen to me and I am your new leader. But he says, no, no, no. The only thing that matters here is the preaching of Christ and him crucified. Humility, fear, and trembling. And so I hate to tell you this because it is a hard truth, but believing in Jesus is not a methodology for the better life. It's not a methodology for the American dream. Believing in Jesus means embracing the way of the cross, the way of descent going down. Believing in Jesus 
is not about feeling happy or getting to be more popular or getting to be great and successful. It's really counterintuitive. It's about accepting the pain and suffering and looking for how God is leading you in that moment. And I have to tell you, as I prepared this message, I am preaching to myself as much as I am preaching to you because I am really convicted by this. Think about your last week. How many, was there any point in time this past week when you decided to avoid doing something because you didn't want somebody to be mad at you? Was there any point in time this past week when you decided to pursue something because you're working on achieving and being great and being successful? Was there any time this week when you pushed yourself to succeed even though it meant giving up on the things that you know matter to God, like time in prayer or time with your family or rest for your soul? Is there any time this past week when you decided to do something or avoid doing something because you didn't want to look foolish even though you knew it was the right thing to do or not do? These are really convicting questions. I'm preaching to myself this day because I like to be successful and effective and well-liked. I like to get straight A's in every class and have the answer to every question. And I like to be great and at the top of my class. But friends, that's not the way of the cross because when I try to control the outcome, suddenly my work and my achievements have become the end goal when really the goal should be worship of God and Jesus should be the one on the throne. My work, and maybe your work, if these questions convict you the way they've convicted me, is to slow down and trust in Jesus to lead us, to listen to what Jesus wants us to do. The way of the cross is not a way to easier life. It's a way of faithful life. Walking away from popularity, embracing suffering as it comes, looking at every failure as an arrow pointing you to where God wants you to grow. Purposely making sure that when you set a goal and an intention and direction, I'm not saying just don't try, but making sure that when you set those goals that you are not doing it for your own glory, but for the glory of of God. Ignatius of Loyola said it this way. He said, oh my God, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as I should, to give without counting the cost, to fight without fear of being wounded, to labor without expecting any reward but the knowledge that I am doing your most holy will. Walking the way of the cross is about doing the work that God has given you to do this day. And then tomorrow, that day. And then the next day, that day. Doing it faithfully and steadily, even if no one knows what you're doing. And then releasing the outcome to God. Trusting that God's desires will be fulfilled. Trusting that when you surrender and open your life to God, God can use your life in amazing ways. Go back to that story of the feeding of the 5,000. When he teaches the crowd and says, no, I'm not going to give you another miracle. That's not the point. You need to believe in me. Thousands turn away. And yet Jesus stays the course. His brothers in the next chapter start to freak out and say, come on, Jesus, you need to get to Jerusalem. Do a tour. Get your numbers back up. But Jesus relaxes and does not listen to that because he knows he is doing what he has been called to do. He trusts in the plan of the Father. He understands that it is God who draws disciples and God who keeps them there. And regardless of the outcome, Jesus trusts that God is responsible for God's mission and will send the right people in the right time. Jesus models that steady contentment, that peace with doing God's will in God's way in God's timetable. When we walk the way of the cross, it seems foolish, but we hold different values beyond effectiveness or success or achievement. And those values show through in how we live our everyday lives. It's evident in how we operate the church, or at least I hope it is. When we follow the way of the cross, we slow down our decision making. We don't have to get everything done right now. What we have to do is listen to where Jesus is calling us to go. When we walk the way of the cross, we let go of our own need to be right or have the best idea. And instead, we prioritize unity with Christ and unity in the openness to what Jesus wants us to do. When we walk the way of the cross, 
we give away what God has given us. We give away our money and our gifts and our time and our talent, which seems foolish to the world that works so hard to gather those things. But when we walk the way of the cross, we give it away, trusting that when we offer ourselves and our gifts, God uses them, even when we don't have control over those gifts. When we walk the way of the cross in each of our households, it means that we prioritize care of our families, care of our bodies, care of our souls. It means that in your household, I hope you take a day of Sabbath rest each week, a time to stop and act like the to-do list is done even when it's not. The to-do list is never done. In the church, it means that we don't use people's time unwisely. We don't have extra meetings or extra emails. In the church, it means that we prioritize the care of our souls, the nourishment of what God has given us to work with. Friends, I'm going to really try to avoid meeting with you on Sunday because of this. Because the way of the cross means that we don't do what's most productive. We do what is most faithful. And so Sunday, I want Sunday to be a day for you to rest and to be filled and to receive the word and love of God. And there are six other days for us to do the church work. I don't want you to be worrying about serving and working for the church on Sunday. Friends, on Sunday, I want you to be connecting with God and with your church family. The way of the cross might not be the most efficient, but it is the most faithful to who God made us to be. When we walk the way of the cross, we do the best we possibly can in every circumstance, and then we release the outcomes to God. Whether it's the bottom line of the bank account, or whether it's the worship attendance numbers, or whether it's the likes or the number of fans that we have, or whatever it is, the salary, the budget, the promotion, we release the outcomes to God, trusting that when we do the faithful work and open ourselves, God is the one who brings it to completion. Why are you here? We're here because of loyalty. And it's loyalty not to ourselves or our own vision, but it's loyalty to Christ. Jesus the Christ and him crucified, counterintuitive, upside down. To the world it is foolishness. But to us who are being saved is life. And it's the power of God. And it's the wisdom of God. And so for that we say, thanks be to God. Friends, we turn out to a time in our worship service which seems like foolishness to the world, but to us it is faithfulness as we give our tithes and offerings. The choir is going to come forward to share with us an offertory anthem. And as they do so, I just want to remind you that over... Hey, Ted, wave your hand. You're standing up by the offering plate. Over near where Ted's standing is where the offering plate is located. And there's also information in your bulletin if you'd like to give online. You could do that now on your phone, or you can take your bulletin home and do it on the Internet at home, whatever makes you happy. However much you give, little, small, often, once in a while, it makes a big difference to how we can continue to live faithfully and generously as a church community in the world. Let's continue worshiping now as the choir leads us in song.
so good to be in worship with you this morning. I have a few announcements to share with you. And before I have a church announcement, I have a prayer announcement. Um, David and Krista McMillan have asked me to share that Krista is expecting. Yay! So, celebrate Krista with you. Um, so we'll certainly surround you all in love. I'm so excited. I'm just like getting new mom excitement. Um, okay, so church announcement things that I also need to share with you. Youth group starts next Sunday, 6.30 in the evening. They'll be meeting outside. Um, Kelly Hubeck is our youth director. Her information is in the bulletin. So if you have a youth in your life that should come to youth group, Kelly's the person to talk to if you have any other questions. Um, in October, October is coming, you all. I cannot believe it. Two weeks away is the first Sunday of October. And I'm going to be preaching a worship series on anxious for nothing through the book of Philippians, talking about anxiety and concern and worry. And what does God have to say to that for us as individuals and us as the church? And so I have two favors I need to ask of you to help with that. One is I'm hoping that I can teach a book study on Anxious for Nothing by Max Lucado. I don't know when you all are available to meet. So there is a little sign-up sheet where you picked up your bulletin. If you would mark that if you'd like to study, the, if you'd like to be in that book study. And if the times on there don't work for you but you still want to do it, write that on there because then I'll know. Um, and if everybody wants to do it but you're not available at the times I propose, we'll look for new times. And I would just love to hear from you. The other... Um, anxiety help I need is in October. I don't want to just be talking about Carissa's worries. I want to be speaking to what's going on in your life as well. And so if you'd be willing to take one of the pages, um, again, by the bulletins that say, what are you worrying about? And you can anonymously fill that out and drop it in the offering plate. That helps me get a sense of the pulse of where you are in your lives so that we can, we can have that series really speak to all of us. And then finally, where is Keith? Keith, would you wave your hand around? Hi, Keith. Mulligan's for Missions is coming. Keith's the guy to talk to. We still need tea sponsors, is that right? Yes. Sorry, I cut Keith off guard. He didn't know I was going to call on him. We still need tea sponsors and Keith and Jerry's information is in your bulletin. Friends, it's been so good to be in worship with you this morning. Now receive this benediction. May you go in peace knowing that Jesus is the one who walks with you every step in the way. May you go in love, serving in this foolish way that turns things upside down. And may you go in courage, knowing that if you